right, we're back. We had some good singing. Hopefully you got some time to worship. Um, let's start with a prayer. <clears throat> Father, we uh, come before you this morning, God. It's, uh, it's a different world today than we're used to. Uh, we are so grateful, God, that you have not changed one bit. We thank you that you love us deeply, God, and that you remain in control of all circumstances of our lives, God, and that we, through prayer and gathering and time in your word and worship and singing to you, God, can just keep putting our trust in you. Thank you so much, God, that although we're separated and we're all in different spots this morning, I know there's a small group here with me right now, I'm so grateful for that, but even those that are isolated and alone, God, that we can be joined by technology, and I really pray God, that we can just sense your nearness and that we can sense the presence of our brothers and sisters, God. You have arranged the parts of the body just as you want them to be, and we are all in this family on purpose, your purpose, and I'm grateful for that this morning. So please be with us all today, and we do pray for our leaders and those who are fighting this uh, problem either locally or on a larger level, God, that you'll be with them right now, Father. We love you. Bless this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so I got... uh, I figured I would read the letter. Um, there's a, a letter from the Desert Cities Leadership Group that got put out um, on the Family Group Leader site. I don't know if it got to everybody. So I'm going to go ahead and read it just to go over it a little bit. All right, and it just says, uh, Greetings, brothers and sisters of the Desert Cities Church. And it's Psalm 27.4, One thing I ask from the Lord, and only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek Him in His temple. You know, we're praying for all of us and everyone during this time of uneasiness. I've been reading Psalms 27, 62, and 91 and encouraged by God's faithfulness and peace that we can have from Him. Just a note, this is, this is from Scott who wrote this. But it is uh, from all of us in the leadership group. But uh, When he says, I have been, that's what he's talking about. We have been in daily contact with Dr. Doug, Webb, Doug Weber, an elder in the L.A. Church, so we can continue to follow best practices at this time. Each part of the country, and even in California, the churches in our fellowship may handle things slightly differently based on the coronavirus situation in their area. We are going ahead with Sunday worship and midweek services for fa- by family group gatherings, and we will adjust accordingly as the situation changes. If you are unable to make it, feel free to worship in your own home. Please let your family group, group leader know if you have trouble getting communion supplies. We respect each family making decisions that God is at work with them and for them in their situation and trust that God is leading all of us. Also, in line with recommendations from public agencies regarding the six-foot social distancing practices, we strongly advise no handshakes, hugs as well. A kind word, smile, or elbow foot bump will be our preferred greetings and and salutations during gatherings. Furthermore, if you are in one of those high-risk categories, The public health department is advising that you do not gather with groups larger than 10. If anyone is sick or feeling under the weather with any of the following symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath, please do not come. It may feel different for us, but we are encouraging social distancing to keep six foot between us. I like to think a lot about it as when my kids have the flu. I love them, but I don't want to get it too. We would encourage you to visit the CDC website and the Riverside County Coronavirus Info website to keep yourself updated on the current current situation and to receive more information on best practices to protect yourself and those around you. Pre-packaged communion cups are available. Um, This was to the family group leader, so hopefully you've got them. And if not, just stay in contact. Even though we're at a distance, let's still stay in contact with one another uh, if you need communion. All right. And um, for the offering, we are encouraging everyone to give online, which I think we mostly do anyway. So hopefully this won't be much of a bump in that area and to remain faithful in giving throughout this time. The three ways to give um, are the app, the website, and or you can mail a check uh, to Richard. And if you need that address, you can get a hold of um, your family group leader and they'll get that for you. Finally, the situation is very fluid, so we will send updates as they are needed. Scott will continue to be in contact with the family group leaders by GroupMe. Please share uh, please share and pass things on to those in your group who are not using GroupMe. Let's contru- continue to pray with one another and connect in health-conscious ways. Prayers and much love, the Desert Cities Church Leadership Group. All right, so there's that. So there's there's uh, what we can do. Now how about a little bit what God can do? Um, probably a lot more of that, yeah. 
So um, I was supposed to preach anyway this Sunday, so I was uh, I kind of adjusted my lesson a little bit when I got um, as things have developed over the last week because things have changed a lot in the last week, really. I mean, my perspective personally has changed quite a bit. And I know that during tumultuous days that we can turn to God for help and comfort because um, fear and insecurity is not something that's, uh, these are pretty good traveling companions during days like this because there's a lot of unknown. When there's unknown, there's fear and insecurity. And there's a lot of great places in the Bible where we can see God, but today we're going to spend some time with Gideon. So... Um, as we do this, I want to see one of the names of God. I don't know if you guys, like, most most of you guys know that, you know, God, in the Old Testament especially, God would be, usually be, it would be the Lord, my rock, the Lord, my shelter, the Lord, my shepherd, the Lord, my banner, the Lord, my healer. So God's name would often be accompanied with a specific title, and that would be one of the names of God. And there's a lot of benefit in setting those different ones out, and we're going to study one of them out today. And the one we're going to study out today is Yehovah Shalom, which is the Lord my peace. The Lord is peace is probably a better. And I like, I like the word Yehovah. It's not actually Jehovah. That's our English version of it. It's Yehovah in the Hebrew. So really today, our main principle through this lesson is going to be that in the midst of turmoil, God is still Yehovah Shalom. In the midst of turmoil, God is still my Lord is peace. All right. So, shalom, cool word. It's a, it's a kind of a Jewish word. It's Hebrew. It's a Hebrew word for peace. And as a lot of words are that are in a different language in ours, especially in the Hebrew and the Greek, um, the word has the concepts much larger than, hey, I'm just, you know, I'm at peace, or we're at peace with each other, or these two nations are at peace, or it's a time of peace. It can mean something like a little bit deeper, like life put together. So when you're at peace, it means your life is put together as opposed to your life is all apart or in pieces right now, which I think we can understand that concept. It can also mean life characterized by a sense of wholeness. So you can be at peace when you feel like your life has got a completeness to it or what it needs um, for you to continue on. And it's certainly when you have a relationship with God, you can have that sense. Um, but also it has this meaning of order, being returned from chaos, which is often backwards for the way I think about it. I often think about my life's in order and it's always going into chaos, right? And I'm trying to keep that from happening. But really, God is the God that takes chaos and brings it into order. God is the tamer of chaos. And a great place to just see this is in the creation account. I mean, the very first of Genesis, God is hovering over the waters of the chaos, and he goes through his creation account, bringing order and setting everything in its proper place, right? And that's a really cool thing. And in another area, you could probably think about this if you're a Christian, is, is your conversion. How God brought order to your chaos. Getting converted in a lot of ways brought a lot of order. And that's, that's the idea of shalom. Shalom. The Lord is peace. He brings order. He brings wholeness. He brings put-togetherness. And um, so we're going to look at this in the story of Gideon. So let's go over to Judges chapter 6. We're going to read verses 6, 1 through 6. And I'm going to pick a little bit out of this instead of reading the whole story because I'm trying to make a point. But these concepts are going to fit really nicely in the whole context of the scripture here. So in Judges 6, verse 1, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelter for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Excuse me. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Those are always good cries. They're not good cries, but God hears those cries for help in our oppression. So, um, first off, I don't think the Israelites are really living in Shalom right here. <laughs> It's not wholeness. It's not put together. 
It is chaos, right? They were living in clefts and caves and strongholds while the Midianites just ran roughshod over their way of life. And that, that was happening. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, because of my mindset, I've often think, of, well, the Israelites did evil, so this is what they get. Or the Midianites were evil, so this is what God's doing to them. And I'm sure that those things are part of why God came to Gideon in this situation, as we see, as we'll see coming up here. But, you know, God also came to bring, put back right what was out of place. And what was out of place was the Israelites were booted from their land by the Midianites. And probably more than anything, God came to bring Shalom. And we'll see that he gets this name from this story later on. All right. So he probably came for a lot of reasons. Um, he was working on the Israelites' heart. He probably had to deal with the Midianites a little bit. But mostly he came to set things right. Let's read in verse 11. Let's skip down a little bit to verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash the Abizirite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? These are always really good questions, huh? That's where this guy, you know, 3,500 or 3,000 years ago is pretty much just like us. Okay, God, this is going down. If you're with us, why is this happening? Right? Good question. Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go, in the strength you have, and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord. He's a polite guy, isn't he? Gideon replied, But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. And I think I was stopping right there. Yeah, I was. Okay. So, God came to Gideon, chose him to defeat Midian, right? So, here's the question. Did God give him power to defeat the Midianites? Nope. Did God give him wisdom to defeat the Midianites? Some great mind that figured it all out? Nope. I was even thinking, did God give him courage? All of a sudden, this pretty, you know, scared and fearful guy all of a sudden found all this courage and was like a different person? Nope. Did God send another army to help him out? Another group of Israelites from some other place or some people friendly to come help them out. No. What did he give them? He gave them his presence. He didn't say, I'm going to do anything but be with you. And that's a really good thought to think about as we face trials in our lives, right? The source of shalom, of peace, is maybe not having it all put together, having all the answers, knowing exactly what needs to happen, being in control, being prepared, how many rolls of toilet paper you got, you know? <laughs> it's the experience of the presence of God. And that's a weird way to say it, the experience of the presence. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. You can intellectually know God is present in your life, but are you, is that your experience? Are you feeling it? And we're hoping today as we go through this that you'll feel it a little bit more, that God is near, all right? And God just promised to be with Gideon as he faced the situation, and that was more than enough. Wow, we could just totally take that into our lives right now, right? Let that sink in. God just promises to be with you in this situation. Right now you're in, and that is more than enough. God's presence in the face of overwhelming circumstances is not just enough. It's more than enough. We learn, this, we learn this lesson in days like this, don't we? You know, there's some lessons you just can't learn in the days of abundance. Right? It's the days of trial where we really learn some great things. And what we learn really a lot during these days is we serve an amazing God. He really is for us. Okay, let's look at verse 23 because I want to get to where that verse is. This, you know, Yehovah Shalom comes from. So it says, But the Lord said to him, Peace, Shalom. Do not be afraid. You are not going to die. Because Gideon had been doing some, uh, some testing, hadn't he? He had been doing some, uh, I need some fleeces here, God. Right? I mean, it's not like he just went, oh, you're with me all, I'm good, right? A little bit of struggle here. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it the Lord is peace. Or 
Yehovah Shalom. To this day, it stands in Oprah of the Abizarites. You know, um, get in and build an altar there, right? It's interesting to me that he did this before he saw God defeat the Midianites. He named, called God Yehovah Shalom. And he built this altar of worship to this attribute of God before he ever saw God defeat the Midianites. So I was thinking about that. I wonder if we consciously need to do things and make decisions to trust in the character of God, the reliability of God, and are reminded about God to help us get to that place of peace. You know, maybe we need to do some things. You know, I'm not saying go stack up 12 rocks, but if you want to, could I guess. All right, let's go over to Isaiah 26 and see this word come up a little more here. I was so glad that um, when I was asked to preach at the park service that there was, I'm not a good PowerPoint guy. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's perfect for me because I don't know how to do PowerPoint. And then now this, this is even better because I'm like a paper Bible and a paper lesson guy. You're lucky this ain't a yellow pad right now. <laughs> I know I need to change. I know I need to change and get with the times here. But this is what it is. All right. So this, this scripture in Isaiah 26, verse 3, is in the song of praise. And it's a, it's a promise that God tells Isaiah the promise prophet to tell um, Israel about a future time. And it's a song of praise. And, and it, it just talks about what will happen in the land of Judah in the future. But I wanted to pick this verse out. It says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Um, I think this verse is a pretty well-known verse, but it's cool when you break it down in the Hebrew because when you blue letter Bible this verse and you look at it, the word perfect is shalom and the word peace is shalom. So it literally reads, um, you will keep in shalom, shalom, those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you, which is kind of interesting for me to think of. You know, our idea in our language, the word perfect and the word peace could be totally disconnected from each other. Like perfect means everything. You're like, oh, you got it perfect. We were watching Ferrari versus Ford last night, which is such a good movie. And uh, yeah, it was just a little break from everything, you know. And uh, he was trying to get the perfect lap in, Ken Miles was. And uh, so I think about perfect in that context, like I did it all perfect. There was no error. But in the Hebrew, it's not really that type of word. And so when I think perfect peace, that means I am just full of peace. I have no doubt. I am no anxiety. I have no fear. And then I go, well, that ain't happening in this head. <laughs> so, you know, you know, in our Western language, it can cause us to not go after concepts that God wants us to go after because we've, we've, made, we've got too extreme in our interpretation of them. And so I like looking at this word in the Hebrew because the word in the Hebrew, perfect, it doesn't mean without defect. It means perfected, it means complete, and it means content. So I kind of rewrote my own verse in the Bible here. Hopefully uh, it's okay, but this is my loose translation. So it, it says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. It might read this, if you take these concepts I'm talking about, those who focus their minds on God's presence in their lives and circumstances are complete and content regardless of what is going on around them. Those who focus their minds on God's presence in the midst of their lives and circumstances are complete and content regardless of what is going on around them. I can see that in that scripture. He says, whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. That indicates there's stuff going on. But they're at peace in the middle of the stuff going on. And, you know, we need that right now, right? <clears throat> if you never thought you could be perfect because of your weakness, be encouraged. Perfection in this sense is not about your doing, but it's about God's presence. Perfection is about God's. Shalom is about God being what God is doing. And we see that in the story of Gideon. I mean, Gideon did what he did because God was with him. Right? Our peace is because God is with us, not because we've had a, you know, we haven't sinned. Okay, we're all out there if that's the case, right? It's not because of the circumstances are all controllable or we've stockpiled enough or whatever we think we need to do. It's simply because we're focused on the presence of God.
And I want to look at this last verse in the, in the New Testament. Let's go to John 14. You know, we got the famous, my peace I give you scripture from John, right? And then we know that this is um, at the night of the Last Supper, right? Right before the cross. And so a lot of things that were said that night from Jesus were really, I think, really super important, but probably not very much heard by the disciples at that time because there was so much stress around losing him and the things he was saying they didn't really want to hear. And um, so John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Hmm, I like that verse. Easier said than done, but I like it, right? You know, I'm going to go to the Greek now. I was in the Hebrew. And I just wanted to say the reason we're looking at these original languages is so that we can break through some perceptions in our translations. There really is a little bit lost in the translation, you guys. Right? Concepts are generally there, but we miss the richness of what is being said here. And here's another example, all right? So the Greek word is for peace that Jesus says here, and you're, you can look this up in your Blue Letter Bible, is arana. Arana. All right? And it means to be, it means peace, but it means more than that. It means to be at rest. So to be at rest, if you think about what that might mean to you, right? To be at peace is to be at rest. And I can see those concepts being connected, right? But it also means tranquil. Arana means tranquil. My tranquil I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. And I do not take back. It's a good thought, right? Um, so this verse could be translated that Jesus left us with his peace or Jesus left us with his at rest. So Jesus left you with is at rest. That's something Jesus gave you. Jesus wanted us to have. It sounds funny because that's not the way we use the language. He left us with his at rest. We could just say he left us with his rest, but it's not his rest. It's yours. It's your at rest, right? And so um, we are left at rest because why? Because of the presence of God, right? Peace comes from the presence of God and the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's what he's saying. When I, This whole context of this verse is not that I just give you peace. It's that he's talking about leaving the Holy Spirit and the Counselor. And we, as Christians, dwell with the Holy Spirit inside of us. Right? So when we dwell with the Holy Spirit inside of us, we also dwell with the peace that Jesus left us inside of us. Which means we also dwell with the arana, or the at rest, and the tranquility that Jesus left us. And I love what it says here. I think it's is the more I think about it, the more it gets um, a big deal. I do not give as the world's give, meaning I don't take it back. Once I give it, you got it, right? So it's something to meditate on that we have that at rest inside of us, right? And then he says, don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I don't know that I want to read that in the commandive, in a, a commanding way, like Jesus is saying, hey, don't be troubled, don't be afraid. It's not that easy to control it, is it? It's, you know, if you look at that verse like, okay, I need to just listen to Jesus and obey the command and not be troubled and afraid. If you can do that, that's awesome. But really, why should we not be troubled or afraid? Because we, Jesus left us his peace. Because God is Yehovah Shalom. All right? So, um... Now, just to kind of wrap up here, we can know these truths, but not experience them. And experience is, for me, is a word that means feel, right? You got to feel. I know we're scared of feelings, right? But feelings really matter because at the end of the day, most people do make decisions based on their feelings, all right? So you can know that God is Jehovah Shalom, but I need you to feel it. And maybe I shouldn't say I need you to feel it. I can know God is Jehovah Shalom, but I need to feel it. And, and so the question is, how can we do that, right? And I think we should have a little discussion here about it. Um, how can we experience or feel shalom, Yehovah shalom? How can we experience or feel arana? And um, I'm going to say a couple words here, and we'll probably cut the live stream. I'll say a prayer and cut the live stream, but 
I think it's a great little discussion if you're in groups at all, or even amongst yourself if you're with somebody. How can you experience the peace of God in your life so that you can focus on God's presence in the midst of circumstances and have peace no matter what's going on around you? And so I thought, well, praying together does not hurt. I always feel better when I pray with somebody else. I feel better. I don't. I, I feel better when I pray by myself. Not always by myself, but definitely when I get with somebody and pray, it usually helps me a lot. And um, I know we're in this quarantining time, but you know we can still get with somebody and pray, or even on the phone, right? I mean, don't forget one of Satan's main jobs right now during this time is what isolate. We all know that. That was good. You guys know isolate. So that's that's one of Satan's plans right now. I think this can be a real opportunity for us. Uh, we can worship together and remind one another. We need to remind each other. God is Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. All right. We can look at God and see him as mightier than your circumstances. You know, I don't know how many times you check the news, and I'm going to check it too. But you might want to check on God's power as much or more as you're checking on the news. Probably a good plan there, right? And talk about it. Remind each other about it. Do scriptures. Look at the scriptures on it. You know, God is mightier than anything we face. And we see that in the story of Gideon. We see that Jesus telling us that. Uh, we know that's true, but we need to feel it. And maybe we need to make some conscious decisions like Gideon's altar to trust in God's presence right now. And uh, I don't know how that's going to work itself out. We're going to probably uh, sit here and brainstorm a little bit on how we might do that. But anyway, I uh, love you guys. That's the lesson for today. Um, I miss being with everybody. And uh, I'm going to close this out uh, in a word of prayer. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll have, find some other way to be connected again shortly. All right? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your presence in our lives. And God, thank you so much that you are a presence of peace, God. And I know that when we misunderstand you and we don't see you correctly and we're blinded by our sin or Satan's got in our head, we see you in more of a fearful way instead of in a calming way. But God, you are mighty in power, and you are mighty to save, and you want to be near us. You created us, God, because we're your good creation, and you love your good creation, and you love going through life with us. And you are near during times like this, God, and uh, I'm just grateful to know that. And I just really pray that you'll help us to get that in our hearts in a greater way. Help us to remind each other during these days. God is mighty. God is with us. God is peace. And uh, I just really um, ask, Father, that you'll be, again, a blessing over everyone. Please protect us and all of our loved ones, God, and be with those around us. Again, God, we lift them up to you. Thank you so much for the church during this time. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless, y'all.